Why are you wearing a bow tie with a t-shirt? Hey everybody, welcome back to the shop. It's really good to see you. Bow ties, despite what Karen says, is cool. Bow ties are cool, just not with a t-shirt. Bow ties in construction, though, are fantastic, and they're classic, and everybody really likes to put them in, especially when you're dealing with a slab with a large crack, but it's difficult. When you're doing bow tie construction, you have to talk about the width of the bow tie, how deep you're gonna route her out, we're dealing with edges, we're making sure everything looks perfect. Have you considered, though, using resin? And using resin as a stabilizer. And in the slab we're dealing with today, it's a beautiful spalted piece, a six foot box elder slab with a large crack. We have ambrosia, we have gray in it, we've got a lot of wormholes. It's also punky and it's got spalted in it. We have to stabilize it. We wanna make sure that we get those soft spots. Resin is fantastic for that and we're going to show you how to do that today. Now to get started what we're going to do is we're going to take the slab that we want to stabilize the crack on and we're going to want to square one end off. Now this is really really important to do in the beginning stages. Don't ask me how I know but you can't square off something that's not square. Because we're going to take a tape measure from the side that we're cutting off to start with and then we're going to take our measurement to the other end of the slab and we're going to cut that end square. Make sure you're leaving your slab long because we're gonna to wanna to trim this up to its final dimension after the pour. That's also a very, very important step. We really lucked out with this slab from our supplier, Paul. I mean, this slab came to us almost perfectly flat with a couple of spots that needed to be tended to. Now, slab flattening is a whole other video. You can use a router sled, you can use jack planes. There's tons of ways to flatten a slab. Just make sure that it's flat both length and width. Now for us in our shop here, we really lucked out with this slab because our drum sander could handle a slab of this side. And because there wasn't really a lot to do, just a touch up, a high spot here or there, we ran about four or five passes through our drum sander with 80 grit, and that made quick work of what we needed to get taken care of. In the top five most important things that you need to do when you're stabilizing using epoxy is cleaning out all the crevices. Last thing you want to do is do a epoxy pour, especially a translucent one that you can see through and find bark or dirt or debris or maybe even an old bug hanging out in your epoxy and there's nothing you can do about it after it's cured. So we do a combination of things here. We use compressed air, we use old dental or crafting picks. We even use old toothbrushes to make sure that all the cracks and crevices and holes are clean before we commit ourselves to pouring the epoxy. Before we make a mold, there's a couple things we have to do, and that starts with identifying where the holes are that are on the bottom of the slab. And there's different ways you can make a mold. Some people will make an entire box to encompass this slab to make sure that it doesn't leak anywhere. We were short on materials, so you can actually do what we're doing here. We grab some old melamine shelving that we've gotten at our big box store, and then you go ahead and you cut it to cover all of those cracks and those holes. To assure that the melamine isn't going to stick to the slab, we're gonna cover it with Tyvek tape. You can use packing tape if you would like, that's fine. Any sort of tape that has a glossy finish on it is going to work. We're gonna take a multi-level protection for leaks on this slab because of the mold that we're using. And honestly, this is what you should be doing for every mold you use if you have holes or cracks that come all the way through. We're gonna ring around every area where we expect leaks to come through with silicone. That creates a dam one area. We then take our mold Tyvek side down, meaning the Tyvek's tape up against the silicone and the wood, and we apply some light pressure. By applying that pressure, we're helping with the bond between the Tyvek tape and the wood, creating, again, level number one for leak protection. Level number two means sealing the outside edge of our mold, and we're doing that with the same silicone caulk. We go all the way around the edge, making sure to use our finger and smear it, yes, I said smear, push it into the crack between the wood and the melamine mold. You'll also notice if you're paying attention to the video that there's a couple areas where it's just Tyvek tape. You can do that. If there's a pin or a wormhole that's coming through, two or three layers of tape that are about three to four times the width of the hole is usually more than enough to make sure that you won't get any leaks out of that area. Step three of Operation Let's Not Leak involves taking silicone and going around the outside of all the areas we're gonna pour epoxy. 
that's gonna allow us to create a pool factor. Now stand by friends, here comes the science. When we pour in our resin, it's going in as a liquid and it is going to turn into a solid, which means it's gonna compress as much as a 32nd to a 16th of an inch. So what I do is I pour these dams around the outside and I over pour the epoxy by approximately a 16th of an inch. That way when it cures and it compresses, when it comes time to demold, there'll be less material for me to remove, be it wood or epoxy. For our casting epoxy, we're choosing to use Stone Coat Countertop Supercast. This is our go-to casting epoxy for any slab work that we do that's more than an inch thick because Supercast was designed to be able to be poured, well, more than an inch thick at a time. Using a mixing cup, we mix a ratio of one to one based on volume. Now, this is a very important distinction because if we were to mix based on weight with Stone Coat, we would create an unbalanced scenario of resin to hardener affecting the cure rate. And that's just not good for our project. Honestly, it's not good for anyone. So we just go ahead and do it based on volume. As for dyes, we're using Stone Coat Countertop's dark red metallic. And we chose that color because it's gonna be a subtle color to add to the flaming box elder and the red that's already in our slab. As for how much dye we use, I'm sure there's some formulation, but eh, we just wing it. It's kind of like a mad scientist experiment for us. We're mad laboratory people. I we love just, it. We I have just great. enough. We place it in the resin, then we use a stir stick. And we stir for five to seven minutes, thoroughly yet slowly, because we don't want to introduce too much air during the stirring process. We make sure to scrape the sides and the bottom of the mixing cup to make sure that we're stirring as much as we can and make sure that we get all of the granules of powder mixed into the resin. And again, we're gonna stir five to seven minutes and then when it's done, it's time to pour. While we're watching everybody's favorite part of epoxy pouring, let's take a minute and talk about our sponsor, Stone Coat Countertops Epoxy. Stone Coat is by far the most DIY friendly epoxy out there. They have everything from their original countertop epoxy to casting resin, to super cast, to ultimate top coat. And one of the things I love about Stone Coat is its durability and its clear factor. Once it is cured, it's required 30 day cure. You really gotta work hard to scratch it. Add the ultimate top coat to it and it is basically scratch proof. It's also FDA approved for incidental food contact. It is heat resistant. And when I was a DIYer and I was starting out on epoxy, their customer service was second to none. Always there answering some of my dumbest questions that I could ask. And believe me, I asked some pretty silly ones and they actually did it with a smile on their face. We pour the epoxy in quarter inch thick increments and then we make sure we torch for bubbles as we're filling. Now on a river table, that's a lot simpler to do than something like this where there are cracks. I can tell you that we just went ahead and poured the full one and a half inch thick at once and we over poured. Remember, we put that silicone there for a reason. And then we waited and over time the bubbles would come out and we would use our propane torch and we would just pop the bubbles. We torched it probably four to five times over an hour and then we were able to actually walk away and let it cure for the required 72 hours. 72 hours sure is a long time to wait, but once the 72 hours was up, it was time to demold and we were pretty excited about that. Using a screw gun, we pulled off the end and then it was just a game of peel. We pull off the Tyvek tape that may have gotten stuck. We get ourselves a scraper and we start working at that silicone. But you'll notice if you're looking at the slab, there's not that much overpour and that's okay. We're gonna be able to sand that off. Sanding the epoxy, I wouldn't call it a breeze, but it is pretty simple and there's many different methods that you can use when you're doing it. Some people will use an angle grinder with a 50 grit metal sanding disc. I've done that in the past, but I have a slight patience problem and have a tendency to burn the wood. For me, I just grab my random orbit sander. I put 40 grit in it. 40 grit makes quick work of the epoxy as well as any silicone that was left. And then I go up the grits from there from 40 to 60, 80, 120, 150, and then finally to the 220 range, which leaves everything scuffed just perfect for us to start doing our seal and our final flood coat. There's only one thing left to do and that's to cut it to its final length. If you remember in the beginning of the project, we left things a little bit long just in case we had some issues and also makes it easier just to clean up the ends. So I grab my track saw and because everything's square now to each other, I mark myself some lines and I cut the piece to the final length. 
For epoxy projects, some people just absolutely cannot get enough of the casting pour, but for us here and me specifically, it's the actual seal coat pour. That's when we get to see the true nature of the wood and the color that we placed in the cracks. We're using stone coat countertops, countertop epoxy this time, and just like casting, you're gonna mix it on a one-to-one -one ratio based on volume, not weight, for the reasons that we discussed before. The difference here though is you're only gonna mix for two minutes, making sure you scrape the bottom and the side of the cup and you can use a paddle drill. Now, a little bit of advice on that. Make sure you're using that paddle drill on slow and make sure you're hanging on to that cup. Again, don't ask us where we get this wisdom from. If you wanna know what happened and what I did to my brand new pair of TrueWorks pants, make sure you check us out on Facebook and Instagram for our Mishap Monday. There's a whole story about it there. Just make sure you hang on to the cup, mix it for two minutes, and try not to introduce too much air, and then you're ready to do your seal coat. We're gonna do three successive pours of seal coats of Stone Coat Countertops Countertop Epoxy. We're using one ounce per square foot of product, and then we go ahead and pour it down the center of the slab and using a shower squeegee that you can get either hopefully at the dollar store or your big box store, we go ahead and we move it around the slab. I usually try, if the wood is punky, to push it actually into the fibers, but generally here what you're trying to do is float it, a, a very, very thin, like 32nd of an inch thick coat. Remember, there's going to be three of these, so it does not need to be perfect. Move it across the slab, making sure as you go towards the outside that you just let it drip over the edge. As for the edges, that's pretty simple. Just take your gloved hand and move it around on the edge and smear it. There's that word again, smear it on the outside the slab where the live edge is and make sure just everything is coated. We're gonna use the same torching regimen that we used for the casting epoxy, except this time we're gonna do the entire slab. I tend to follow a regimen that has me torching immediately after the application of the seal coat, 15 minutes after that, and 30 to 45 minutes after that, and that should be enough to take care of all the bubbles. We're gonna do this three times, and we're gonna make sure that we sand at 220, just lightly etching the surface between each seal coat, following the same torching regimen. By the time we're done with the third seal coat, our slab should be perfectly flat with very, very few voids in the surface. If there are some voids though, don't worry, you're gonna take care of that on the flood coat. While I tend to hand sand in between each seal coat, before we get started for the flood coat, I break out another random orbit sander. And we put a 220 pad on there and we make sure we sand the slab very, very well. Remember those voids we were talking about? Typically, they'll be taken care of by a 220 sanding. You can even feather it a little bit. Be careful on the edges though. You're gonna wanna hand sand the edges and the live edge itself because you don't want to sand through your seal coat. It's difficult to do, but it's totally possible. So make sure you're hand sanding those edges. Once you're done sanding, get yourself a paper towel and I tend to use denatured alcohol. You can even use some acetone. Make sure you get all that dust off before you do your flood coat. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, three ounces per square foot of crystal elegance. Yes, it is time for the flood coat. Three ounces per square foot should do it. We pour it down the center of the slab and we mixed it just like we did every other coat based on volume, not weight. We also tip the bucket over and just kind of leave it there to make sure we get everything we can out of the bucket and just let it lay out on the slab. Once we do that, we use an eighth inch trowel and we trowel it starting from the center, moving to the outsides across the entire top surface of the slab. You don't need to worry about the edges or the sides, if you will, in this scenario, because we're gonna get those with a brush. So leave as much as you want on the top, working from the center to the outside, and then gently roll it over the sides. Once you're done with that trowel, it's time to take care of those trowel lines. Yes, resin will actually self-level. However, in this particular case, using Stoco countertops, it's suggested, and I suggest along with them, that you take a chop brush. You have two options with this. You can go to your big box store and you can buy a chop brush, a normal two inch brush will do. Or you can go to your dollar store like I did, or your grocery store and get a silicone basting brush, which means you can use it over and over and over again. And you're just gonna randomly chop, or you know what, that tends to hurt my wrist and shoulder on these bigger slabs. You can chop or swirl around to get rid of those lines. That serves two purposes. Number one, the first purpose is it gets rid of the lines, but most importantly, what it does is that last 
mix that's going on to make sure if you've got any surface tension issues on the top or any unmixed product, it's going to take care of that when you do the chopping motion. When you're done chopping the entire slab, you're going to take your silicone brush or chopping brush and you're going to wipe the sides down of your project. That means both sides of the live edge and the two long ends, making sure that you're doing long, even strokes along the sides. And what that will do is that'll give your final eighth of an inch coat on your sides as well. And after the flood coat, we're back to the same torching regimen that we did before. Just like I said, immediately at the 15 minute mark and then 30 to 45 minutes after that. At that point, you should have minimal, if any, bubbles left on that last torching. And if you see some after the 45 minute mark, you can always spot check it and hit it with the torch and that'll take care of it. Then you're gonna let your slab set up for 24 hours. It'll be dry to touch in 24 hours and then fight the urge to put something on it because it's gonna take approximately seven days for light usage. And believe me, you just don't wanna risk messing up such a beautiful finish. Take a minute to talk about our sponsor, Stone Coat Countertops Epoxy. I've been using Stone Coat for the better part of four years at this point, and it is just by far the most amazing product. There's a lot of cool things about Stone Coat that we don't have with other epoxies. It's FDA approved for food contact. It's heat resistant to 450 degrees. It has insane amounts of scratch resistance. It's almost bordering on scratch proof. We've got casting epoxy. We have countertop epoxy. We have flooring epoxy, which you're going to see a video on. There's so much you can do with it. So everybody at Stone Coat, Thank you from the bottom of our hearts and we look forward to working with you guys in the future. And thank you for helping us make our art.